Hi, it's Peter Blows. Welcome back, of course, to The Shoot here on 710 KNUS. And now, of course, I'm lucky enough to do the morning show, 9 a.m. here on 710 KNUS Saturday mornings. So this is how this show works. And The Shoot named, of course, after professional wrestling. Everything's a work and everything is real. It's called a shoot. So I'm on my motorcycle and it's Labor Day weekend and I stop at a friend of mine's roadhouse and I run into Susan Phelan, of course, a recognizable name, been dem doing Denver traffic for forever. Actually, I was a traffic reporter as a kid and then she's done an excellent job. I love Susan, but she's also a very, very, very talented musician. She said, come here, I want you to meet somebody. So I walk up on the stage and this is, of course, who it is. It's Michael. We do a handshake and she said, Michael's got a book. And I said, and I, everybody's got a book. So I say, yeah, right. give me the book. You know, <laughs> right. so I take the book, put it in my saddlebag, and I head home. So I'm plopped on the couch, been through the gym, been through a motorcycle ride, watched my grandson. So I crack this book, and it takes me. The road never ends. Michael Yoakum. <laughs> Mom, boy. I, tell, I, I, it's a, I feel like, like we've known each other forever. Kindred spirits, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, Thanks for having me, Peter. Thank you for doing the show. You bet. My pleasure. Um, we share so many things kind mm -hmm. of in common, and then we share, I have no abilities other than to run my mouth, and you... Me too. Uh, well, no, Except you, to play the drums. You can play the drums. It. Yeah. Start at the beginning. I mean, here you are, and how old were you the first time they actually paid you to play? I was, uh, I was actually tw I was 12 years old, That's and I was only six months into playing the drums. Um, but I knew, I, I really knew like a month into starting to play and starting to take lessons come out because my parents could see that I had a real interest in it and that I would be dedicated because I told them, I said, this is what I wanted. And I, I would tell them, I said, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. This is what I'm going to do. And, they, and of course, at the time, they were like, sure, Michael, we, yeah. we get it, you know. But my first paying gig was, and I don't know if you had Shakey's Pizza Parlors out here. They did, didn't they? Yeah, Mark's here. Mark probably said yes. Yeah. Shakey's Pizza Parlors. My first paid gig <laughs> was at the Shakey's Pizza Parlor, Friday and Saturday nights. My father would load me up in his 1952 Chevy uh, truck, pickup truck, mm -hmm. put the drums in the truck, take me to the Shakey's Pizza Parlor there in Burbank, California, where I grew up. Uh, drop me off, help me set up my drums at about 7 o'clock, and then he would pick me up at 10, and that was a Friday and Saturday night, and I would make $50 a night, which, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a tremendous amount of money for a 12-year-old in 1974 -ish. It's a tremendous amount of money for a 79-year-old. <laughs> right. Uh, of course, you know, for the most part, is, uh, you know, some musicians don't get paid any more than $50 or even in pizza, today. Get paid in pizza and beer. Get paid pizza and, and yeah. chicken, yeah. fried chicken. So... That was my first pick. Because I've seen the picture. How many pieces, how many guys in the band? So it was, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a duo. <laughs> yeah. It was me and an accordion player. The Stomach Steinway. The Stomach Steinway. <laughs> I, mean, I love that. It makes, uh, it's perfect, yeah. it makes perfect sense, too. Yeah, it was just me and, a, me and an accordion player. And actually, the accordion player that I was playing with was the owner of the music studio in Burbank that I was taking lessons at. So he knew right away that I was talented. He's like, hey, would you want to play maybe a shaky? You know, I'm like, of course. Of course. I did that for, for a while. You know, you know there, is, <laughs> there is such a thing as talent. I mean, there, yeah. there, or it's a, it's a, I've been given the ability to read. That's my only thing that was ever gifted. Hey, you can read books. Okay, cool. Take a job. Right. And we, we were talking earlier uh, be, before about, yeah. about the fact that, uh, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that it's when talent meets opportunity. You know, you have, to, you have to be able to deliver. That's the key, right? Yeah. And it's not really by luck no. that things happen. It's mostly that, yeah, there's some luck involved, but, you know, at the same time, you have to deliver when the opportunity is, we, arises. We, we talked about John Bernard Books. I was willing. Yeah. And that's a great moment in um, The Shootist. Right. When the Ronnie Howard character said, how were you able to shoot all those people, kill all those men? He said, I was willing. Exactly. Yeah. So you were willing to go. I was. Yeah, and, yeah and I, I knew that I was gonna th that that was gonna be my life. Now I didn't exactly know how I was gonna make a living doing it, but but certainly as a matter. as a young creative yeah. person, it didn't it didn't matter. You know, it was just uh, just the work. Who took you on the road first? So my first ro real road gig was with this amazing uh, woman who became one of my primary mentors as a young musician. Uh, her name was Kelly Green. Oh, sure. Yeah. You remember Kelly Green? I do. So I Kelly do. and then Green, uh, Kelly Green, and she she was actually uh, she was uh, presented to the world by the uh, impresario Saul Hurok. If you remember who yeah. Saul Hurok was, yeah. and she was the only musician that he had on his roster. So Kelly was already a, a, an established um, musician uh, and and great piano player and just a, a wonderful person. Um, and she saw me at a jazz festival when I was 15. 
in, in high, just a, a freshman in high school and commented on, you know, the, you would have three judges that would judge a jazz festival. We hosted one at Burbank High School. And she always, she would be commenting like, you know, great drummer, great time, great drum solo. And then sure enough, a couple of days later, I get a phone call and I'm sitting there at dinner with my parents and the phone rings at the back of the kitchen. My dad goes to answer the phone. He says, my, Michael, it's for you. It's this woman named Kelly. And I'm like, Kelly? And I didn't really connect. And sure enough, it was Kelly Green. And Kelly Green offered me um, at first uh, to, to work the uh, weekends in, uh, in the Valley in Los Angeles where I grew up, Sherman Oaks, uh, you know, Studio City, um, at a place called The Office. It was called The Office at that time. And that was a Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday matinee gig that I did for about a year. And then, okay, Michael, I was uh, just about 16 at that time. We're going to go on the road. So it was my first, and then my first, uh, my first road gig was in Toronto in, 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 the, in winter, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And then from there, we went to Washington, D.C., and New York. I, you know, yeah. Flip it. So one of the kids comes to you now. And he's 15 or she's 15 and says, I'm going on a road. Yeah. What would you say? Uh, wh wh how much does it pay? I, yeah. well, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what? 15 yeah. or 16 years old, it's yeah. all about the experience. No, I mean, yeah. I... Are your parents okay with this? Yeah. I mean, really? Or do, yeah. You know, I, I always encourage people to, to, to go, with the, sure. you know, go with their intuition, you know. And, and um, if, it, if it makes sense, yeah. then, then do it. You know? We've talked about pro wrestling before the camera yeah. started, but... Uh, Bobby, Bobby Heenan, and I'm walking through the parking lot in Casper, Wyoming, after a crazy night. Mm -hmm. And I've told this story before, and I'm going, I had a ripped tuxedo, and I got punched, you know, and, I, and I'm saying, what a night. And Bob turns me around and says, did you get paid? Right. And at that yeah. point, I knew everything there ever was to know about this business. I started to understand what, get, how important it was to get paid uh, as creative. <laughs> I think as creative people sometimes, yeah. Um, people that are uh, what I consider normal people, not musicians, no. <laughs> don't quite understand what we go through yeah. as creative yeah. people to bring our and art. you want to do it so badly. Right. But if you read about you know, big movie stars or over-the-top musicians, or, and they waited, I'm not going to do that unless you pay me this. Right. And you're a kid. Yeah. What did they pay you to go on the road? How much did you? So I was making maybe a couple of hundred dollars a week, uh, including accommodations. Yeah. Uh, um, we were taking care of our own food uh, at the time, and we were traveling by car. Yeah. So I'll never forget uh, Kelly pulling up in this, you know, this this Lincoln Continental. Yeah. Literally, we traveled on the road with the bass player and myself and Kelly, and uh, Kelly, Kelly's uh, Kelly's wife at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, Dorothy Gray of Dorothy Gray Cosmetics, which is sort of another interesting connection with Saul Hurok. Anyway, with her two cats and her dog in mm -hmm. in this huge, and it almost seemed comfortable. This Lincoln was so sure. huge, this long. So we traveled uh, that way, you know, by car, uh, and and went to Washington D.C. We went mm -hmm. to New York. It was an amazing experience for me as a 15 year old. Uh, there were stories about Elvis leaving Memphis with they have the stand up bass tied down on the roof. That's exactly right. True story. You see pictures all the time. True story. Yeah. What did you start um, when, you, when you began to really start to learn the road? Mm -hmm. What did you learn? Um, I learned that it's a difficult proposition, that, uh, that the idle, idle hands, idle time is the devil's playground. Yeah. You have to really learn how to occupy your time. And of course, it, you know, un unfortunately, learning experiences in my early 20s when I started to tour in earnest with name groups, you know, bigger, bigger bands, yeah. that... Uh, that you have to be, uh, you know, your your time has to be spent doing productive things and not unproductive things like, you know, getting into, you know, things that you Drugs shouldn't be getting alcohol. into. Yeah. Drugs and alcohol yeah. in particular. Yeah. And it's it's easy. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's a, a difficult proposition at best being on the road yeah. uh, and almost impossible at its, at its worst. But at the same time, I, I enjoyed the experience. Also, as a 21-year-old uh, drummer, not really understanding still how I was going to make a living as a musician. Um, I was getting ready to have a, my first my Man, first little girl at 21 amazing. years old. So and I had she's to figure now out. How old? She's, she's 42. Wow. So I had to figure out how I was going to balance this musician life with actually making a living at it. So at first, especially in my 20s, I was I was home a lot doing studio work, and I talk about it in in the book that my very first recording session was in 1975. And it was for the uh, theme session for the series, The Love Boat. Now, you, you remember well, The Love Boat. Of course I do. Right, and it's still on in syndication. Sure. I get little checks trickling into my mailbox every <laughs> once in a while, which is kind of a treat, you know. Yeah. 
But um, I, I'll never forget it because it, it has everything to do with me being chronically on time as well because oh. I walked into the studio at 8 a.m. for an 8 a.m. call. I actually walked in about 7.30 or quarter yeah. after 7, of course. And I see music stands lined up like little soldiers all in yeah. the, in the yeah. huge recording studio. And there was an orchestra there waiting for me Right to be on time to make sure I was on time because I mean, imagine a, a hundred piece orchestra doing the Love Boat theme, how expensive all that is, right? Love so, exciting and new. Love exciting <laughs> and new. We're expecting you, me. me. We're expecting me to show up on time. Oh. So ever since then, I've been chronically on time. It's one of the rules of this business, and I try and teach yeah. it to these young guys. Yeah. What does six a.m. mean? What well, really means four thirty? It does. And what time does? Well, that really means two and a half hours before. Yeah. It really is when you have to be there. And exactly, some people yeah. think you can just walk in, sit down in front of the microphone, and say, "Okay, what are we what are we going to do for a show today?" Mm -hmm. Doesn't work that it's way. It's not that simple. No, no. And yeah. I've seen it for years and years and years. People right. trying to do exactly that, and mm -hmm. you go, "No, this really is a four a.m. start." Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, when when <laughs> when you're good and they know who you are, uh -huh. you had an agent through all of this. I it's not it's not so much an agent for what I was doing, uh, but the, the contractors in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. There's there were several uh, contractors. Keeping in mind that in 1975, I came into the business right at the very end of what would be considered the um, uh, the 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 old school mm -hmm. of the studio guys. Mm -hmm. Like I'll name some names: Carol Kay on wow. bass, Hal Blaine on drums. You're talking about the the rhythm sections that that would do the Beach Boys records and you know all those big records at the time, mm -hmm. and they were not necessarily retiring, but it was sort of a time where they were they were in their twilight years, so there was this new crop of musicians coming up coming into the fold, uh, in 1975, 1976. That was also before digital, wasn't it? It was it was well, way before any of that yeah, was happening, yeah. but that's a whole other story sure. because I saw that I saw the writing on that wall in the mid 80s, yeah. but so I was fortunate in that. I had contractors that believed in me that would call me. And, you know, really, I mean, you know, well enough in the radio business, it's really a matter of, you know, what mm -hmm. have you done for me lately? So if I was showing up on time, if I was playing well, if I was uh, had a good attitude, I'd be called for the next session. If not, I'm, there was 20 other guys behind me that would want to have that session. We have these great lines that were given up, but we are with you when, when, or when. Right. <laughs> or my other favorite one. <laughs> right. There, there is no I in team, but there is in radio. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Oh, it's like, no, it's the, the I mean, I, mm -hmm. when I was a disc jockey, a country jock, where we got to introduce, put over front Red Rocks or clubs and stuff, and Waylon Jennings and, you know, all, right. all those guys. And I, I, I was, I watched it, and, I, and that was when the other light went on. Yeah, it's, these guys have tremendous ability, but this is a business. It's a business, yeah. yeah. I, that's why in, in, in the book many times I refer to the, the, the music business as the business mm -hmm. of music. Yeah. I mean, people have, have to understand that this is a business. You know, we're up there, we're up there or we're recording, yeah. we're bringing them what, what has been our art form for yeah. the past, you know, yeah. the past 30, 40 years. But at the same time, the business of music is a whole nother, nother part of this thing. And I became very good friends with Barry Fay, the yeah. legendary promoter. Of course, I, yeah. I was backstage with Barry many times. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of this fascination. Well, what's going on backstage? Actually, there was accountants that are doing this. Yeah, that's Selling exactly what it is. And you bet. There's a food table, but right. I, and all the years I traveled with him a little bit, I never saw anything. I mean, there was some crazy stuff, but backstage, there's this enormous party going on. It's it's I a. Didn't it, see it. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 when you're not, I, I think when you're not uh, looking for it, yeah. no, <laughs> that I, you don't see it right. as much. And th that's true. I saw guys doing this, you know, <laughs> counting the money. Yeah. 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 But there is another life, and that's. And that's the business of music. And yeah. it's, it's, it's an aspect of, of the business that I've always, of music yeah. and the art and the creativity of music that I've always had, had a difficult time reconciling, you know. At the same time, you have to make a living doing it, but, uh, you know, how far will you go to make a living doing it? In other words, will you work with this artist that yeah. maybe you don't have that yeah. much respect for? Well, I, we've all, I, we've done sure. that. Sure. You know, what's the great line? The Chinese character for uh, disaster is opportunity, and inside of talent is curse. Right. Is it's it? true. It no, is. I, th I think so. Yeah. You know, I think it can be. You know, I think it can weigh on you heavy. You know, to have this enormous amount of talent, and uh, especially if it hadn't, if it if it's never realized yeah. through through your life, you know, 
that, uh, and, and you know, it's, it, it's remarkable to think that there are so many talented musicians, artists yeah. out there that never get the due that they deserve. I, I always said this, how good is good? Mm -hmm. And sit ringside, watch great fighters, that's good. Right. Or watch, you know, the, the videos of Rush Limbaugh working, mm -hmm. that's good. Right. Or, you know, watching Tom Brady, wow. Right. So, you know, then you see guys that think are good, but they never got there. Right. Why? Um, God, it's just... It's, it's, such, it's such a balancing act in the first place that I think that, uh, you know, this idea of talent meeting opportunities sort of never happens. Yeah. I, and, I, and I also believe that you have to be absolutely committed. I mean, you have to be, you know, your, your commitment has to be so strong that it overrides any sort of, uh, any, you know, uh, a anything that would, that would essentially sort of trip you up, you know. Uh, there's a price. You just keep on going, there's, and there is a price to sure be paid. And, and you know, the price at the time for me, being a 21-year-old young drummer who had a lot of potential, was that I would be array, away from this now all of a sudden brand new family. Yeah. So I knew that in my 20s that what I really wanted to do was I wanted to do recording yeah. work. And that would keep me in town instead of like a lot of my peers who would end up, didn't have families right away in their 20s, who would end up, you know, touring with this band or that band or that artist. Um, it just wasn't for me at the time. It took me until I was like in my late 20s mm -hmm. where I finally started balancing my studio career in Los Angeles with being able to go on the road as well. And keeping in mind also that if you go on the road, then somebody else is going to be taking that, that, <laughs> l that next week's Love Boat session yeah, or yeah. Happy Days, which I did, Laverne and Shirley. I mean, yeah, the, I in the early days, I did all those shows. I was willing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I tell the story about... Yeah, know. having the willingness, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, we, uh, Mark and I were talking before it began, legendary um, radio man in Denver by the name of Gus Merkus. Uh -huh. And Gus went, did morning news on KOA, but he was one an early mentor of mine. So I think it was sometime after Thanksgiving and I'm in grad school and I'm working as a disc jockey. Come here, mate. And we went up to a, what people now euphemistically don't say, a greasy spoon restaurant right. in Colfax. <laughs> right. And he looks me in the eye and says, <laughs> did you ever notice, which was a kind of a Gus approach, mm -hmm. When you turn the radio on on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, and you want that there's somebody there, and I went, "Come to think of it," and he said, "Well, this year it's you." Wow. Well, now yeah. here's your choice. Yeah. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, right. don't work. Right, right. And you were willing. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly right. Yeah, having the willingness to 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 do it, and sometimes against all odds, you know, yeah. and really putting yourself out there in a big yeah. way, exposing yourself, exposing yeah. your talent to people. You know. the, you, one of the things we both share is addiction and recovery. Indeed, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how old were you when you started to drink? Um, so I didn't have a drink or a drug uh, in my t in my teens and through high school. I wasn't that guy. I wasn't the party guy. I was the guy who was sitting in the pra in the practice room during everybody else doing gym class, practicing my instrument. You know, tuning myself up for what I knew was going to be my future. Um, so the drinking and the drugging started happening in my mid twenties. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and not in, really not until then that uh, you know it hadn't taken hold of me until my mid twenties. What is and it? What precipitated? What, yeah, yeah. What is it? About uh, us? I think yeah. just uh, just being exposed to a world that it was it seemed especially during that period of time that it was commonplace early eighties that yeah, everybody was was doing cocaine, everybody yeah. was doing this and that, whatever your drug of choice happened to be. Everyone was doing it, and it was it was readily available at the same time. You know, as a musician, it was always like, "Hey, take the, oh. take that after oh. a show, after a sure. session, yeah. during a session." <laughs> um, but I have to say that, for the most part, and I can't say this unequivocally, uh, absolutely, uh, for everything that I ever did, I was always sober for for my for my yeah. playing. Yeah. I mean, I could have been up all night, maybe, sure. but I would always show up for that eight o'clock uh, recording session. Well, that's the intrinsic part of it was. Yeah, you know the devil you know, the devil you don't know. But exactly. Yeah. Y when you're schooled by these same people that we're talking about, uh -huh. you be there. I also had a lot of respect for the people that 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 I was working with, and the fact that these people were doing cocaine or doing this or maybe drinking to excess after the recording yeah. session. Yeah. I wanted to be a. P I I needed to be a part of that. Yeah. You know, I felt like I had to be a part of that, and I'm I've learned over my com you know coming up on 18 yeah. years of sobriety, July 14th. That I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to be that guy. Everybody has you know. a place. A story that when uh, after 
my friend was murdered and I have a real good mentor in sobriety who's no longer with us. But he sat me down in his office and gave me the snatch and he said, you know, he said, there's only three places guys like me and you end up. And I went, I'll buy. And he said, um, in an in institution, a prison or a jail, right. on a morgue slab mm -hmm. or in a meeting. Right. And I said, there's a fourth way. What's the fourth way? I don't know. I yeah. came back and said, okay, I give, yeah. I give up. There has to but be. But I was sure way. there was a fourth way. There had to be. Oh, I, I'm not <laughs> out there looking for the, the yeah. fourth hole, right? Well, there isn't one. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting. And, and I, I knew that. Uh, and, and really, once I was done, I was done. Yeah. You know, the cocaine went away in, in 92. Uh, yeah. The drinking was still there. Yeah. The um, experimentation was still there with other drugs. Uh, but it didn't take hold into 2005 completely. Was there a moment? Uh, there, uh, there was an absolute moment. Everybody's um, got one. Yeah. yeah. My, uh, so I was born with, uh, with, a, uh, with a, a birth defect, genetic malformation of the neural tube is what it is. It's called spina bifida. Sure. So it's a, it's a spinal cord uh, malady. It's a neurological d uh, deficit. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, I've had to have, well, to, to date, I've had seven laminectomies on my spinal cord to wow. detether my spinal cord which is wrapped up in, sure. in, in scar tissue. Yeah. So, but, so anyway, but in, in July 14th, 2005 was my, was my first surgery. And uh, I, was, I was drinking all the way up until my surgery, yeah. literally in the parking yeah. lot course, here yeah. in Denver at uh, that, that the hospital that sounds, drinking and that using. That sounds abnormal to others. To right. me, well, sure. Yeah, yeah. It, seemed like, it seems commonplace. <laughs> Come on. You know? <laughs> and, and even when the, uh, the, the anesthesiologist asked me, he said, you know, have you had anything to drink or eat? And I said, I haven't anything to eat. But I, you know, but I didn't say anything else. So sure enough, um, I had the surgery. It was about an eight-hour surgery to detether my spinal cord. And I, I woke up, and, and they could not give me enough pain medication to mitigate my pain because I was so intoxicated to begin with. Uh, it took about two weeks for me to have. They'd kill action. you if they took you to where you had to be. They might kill you. Exactly, yeah. and that's what they I've were concerned about. So I, I kind of went in and out of consciousness. I woke up at some point, and a dear friend of mine, uh, a bass player, uh, the bass player with Bonnie Raitt for many years in her Philadelphia days, her, her formative days is what I would say, and his name is Freebo, and he's a dear friend of mine. He's in the book. And F Freebo's in the book, and he showed up at the hospital. Why? I don't even know why he was there. He lives in Los Angeles, but there he was. And I open my eyes, and there's Freebo standing there like a little angel. And he goes, you know, Michael, you have a choice. And yeah. I, I knew exactly what he meant. And ever since then, I hadn't taken a drink. You know, I, That was the moment. I, that was the pivotal. Yeah. That was the jumping off point, yeah. as they say. You know? It's interesting with alcoholics and addicts. And um, we talked about this before, before, we began, before we began to tape. A lot of people don't want to talk about it. And you, you made a really good point about that. But the other part of it is when guys are open, Guy, everybody has, it seems to be, everybody has that moment. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, you can double down, you can triple down, but eventually, back to what was said to me, you're going to end up in one of three places. Right. You choose. Right. And that's what he said. Yeah. He, I mean, he said, you have a choice. And I knew exactly what he meant. I didn't, have, didn't need any, any hyperbole from him at all about that, what that choice is. I knew it. And that, and that was it for me. And that was 2005. And mm -hmm. into the world of politics and reality, Mm -hmm. That's when I watch these people talk about homelessness. Right. Well, we're going to take care of them. No, that's the absolute worst thing you can do. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and many, I would say, 90 plus percent of these people on the street are me and you. Right. So Absolutely. Th so they're yeah. going to give them a paycheck and they're going to take care of them. No. Who? Right. They wouldn't have stopped you. Right. Uh, no, it would, nothing would have stopped me. Yeah. I, I knew there would be a moment where I was, and I, was, I yeah. really was done. Yeah. You know, because I'm asked, and I'm like, well, I was just, I was finished. I, I had had it. Yeah. You know, enough was enough for me. Yeah. Now, I was still dealing with prescription medications because of my, uh, because of my spina bifida and mm -hmm. because of my tether cord. So I suffer from neur yeah. neuropathic yeah. pain as a result. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, but still, yeah, overdoing no, that, but cool. then that kind of went away in 2011, I, you know. Um, it's a it's a slippery slope, man. You know, it, it is for all of is us. Is there anybody else in your family that's alcoholic? My mom, uh, yeah. my mom was an alcoholic, and, yeah. uh, and my my father was just a raging person. Yeah, <laughs> dry, they call him a dry drunk, and that was sure, sort of, of that epitomized my father. We all have yeah. genetic predispositions, as they say. We do, and, and yeah. cultural cultural. Yeah. But I try and make the point. Treat it like a disease and you got a chance. Mm -hmm. Treat it like a behavior, you lose. 
Right. And how many, I mean, I can't tell you how many great radio guys that I knew that are gone. Oh, I can't tell you how many great, of, incredible musician peers of mine are gone. And not just famous musicians. Oh. Guys that I that I grew up with playing recording sessions. Play their eyes out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just a shame. Yeah. And I mean, there's a list, and I was knew we were going to talk today. I'm trying to write myself, and I'm going down this list. It's staggering. Yeah, it is. In the '70s, and the '80s, and the '90s, and after the turn, and these guys are gone. Yeah. And they should they should be sitting in this room with us. Talking. They should be. I yeah. wish they were. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Me too. You went to Europe. You got some great stuff about traveling in Europe in the book. Yeah. I you know I went to your, the the one story that 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 I think comes to mind and that probably the one that you're talking about was you know I did I did everything I could to at that time to be of service to to people that I saw that were still struggling, and and folks that were willing you know, because uh, the twelve step not to yeah. get all program yeah. on no, everybody no. but it does say. That mm -hmm. once we have, you know, you discovered, we, you yeah. know, we, we yeah. want to be of service to others and, and help others choice. along yeah. the road, yeah. right? So um, I, I had a dear friend of mine who was a guitar player in, in this band, and I was, I was working with the band Korn. And I'll say it. Mm -hmm. I was working with the, the rock band Korn. Yeah. And uh, this, this guy was just struggling to stay sober. He had a, a new family and a baby on the way. And he just could not manage to stay sober. But during that during that tour and during the rehearsals before that tour, uh, indeed, you know, he was sober and trying to keep it together. But you could just tell that he was on the precipice yeah. of, and and it all came to fruition in in Slo Slovakia, actually, of uh, Slovenia, of all places, in a little hotel room where he f he just he lost it, and yeah. that's. The story you in the to, book. You went in the room. Yeah. I went in his room and I saw that the 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 guy had had drank his entire mini bar. I mean, I'll never forget it. And the television, you know, there was a commotion in the next room at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Long story short, I'll capsulize it. And, I, and sure enough, the the guy was standing in his underwear at the end of the hallway, yeah. throwing potted plants down. You know, oh. and I could tell obviously that he was that he was loaded. Yeah. W went, peered into his room. The TV set, you know, reminded me of the olden days when you talk about how rock stars would wreck their hotel rooms. It looked just like that. Sure. The TV wasn't even in the room anymore. The TV was actually hanging out the balcony by the cord. You know, and I was like, wow, how did he manage that? But the, the most telling part was the fact that the, the door to the refrigerator was open and every single bottle was emptied. Um, and yeah, and, and but that that guy, um, a terrific guy, and there's a lot of terrific people that are, that are struggling out there, you know, um, and became even even a better person in sobriety. Uh, and uh, we've we've talked since then. So, yeah, I've I and I've had my own experiences on the road with that as well. I've holed myself up in a hotel room when I was in Prague, the one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Uh, I'd rather stay in here and drink. I'd rather stay in here and drink. Close the curtains, put yeah. the TV on, you know, called room service. Sure. And at the end of that week, I had pretty much drank up my entire week's pay, sure, sure. which is pretty difficult yeah. to do. <laughs> so you have to work at it, yeah. Yeah, you have to work at no, it. I mean, I, I, once again, if you can, and how do people find a book? Because it's a self published It's on, uh, it's on PayPal, uh, and it's on. Uh, I mean, uh, you can. It be, can be paid through PayPal sure. or Venmo, um, and the book is twenty dollars, autographed by by the author. And, and, and it and it really is. I mean, it, this is one of those fluke things. I get off my motorcycle. <laughs> I see Susan, Susan, and I, know, I, so it's I, great. I took, I take the book home, oh, and I actually, I think I went in the house and said, oh, wait a minute, that book's in my saddlebag. And I'm, I read a lot, and I put my feet up, and I opened the book, and I said, whoa. And then I realized that you were one of us, you know, it's or I'm one of you. Uh, yeah, we are. Yeah. And we're kindred, kindred yeah. spirits for yeah. sure. And I, and I actually asked Susan, I said, you know, is Peter going to really, you know, you think he'll really read the book? You know, is mm -hmm. he really interested? And she looks at me with this very sincere Susan face, mm -hmm. and she goes, he's a voracious reader. He'll be reading. And you did. Well, and you remember, read it. The hardest thing to do when you can't go to the bar anymore. Yeah. <laughs> remember, you find out, I got right. all this time on my hands. Yeah. I learned to ski. Is what, that's when I went to learn to ski. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, good. Yeah. You got, yeah. where did all this time come from? I know. I have all this spare time now. <laughs> what happened? I, I'm, I'm not doing what I used to do. As far as as far as the the how I structured the the book, I've ri I had written two books before this, but I, I feel like this book everything kind of came together the way it should uh, it, with the third book because I, I couldn't consider myself to be a writer, but at the same time, people wanted to hear my stories about my yeah. life as sure. a musician. Yeah. They were really interested, and I was fascinated yeah. by the fact that people were actually interested in my life yeah. Yeah. because honestly, Peter, I don't know about you in your radio career, I looked at it as being a job. What is a job? You know, I mean, I looked at it as this is how I make a living. Oh, no, well, people course. aren't going to be interested no. in this stuff. No. You know, why would they be? This is just my job. Did you get paid? Yeah. 
that was my moment. And it was years right. ago. That was my moment. And yeah. I went, wait a minute. Yeah, I did. I said, he said, did you get paid? And I said, yeah. yeah. And the follow-up is, we used to call them church vans. They'd have like 900 people in a, in a big Ford in a, or Chevy. In a 10-passenger van. Whatever it was. And you probably <laughs> rode many miles in them. That's how we're, I'm so, traveling right now. As a the guys wanted to smoke pot and drink, so of course I drove. You're driving. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, and that was the great lesson. And I, uh, like I said, when I was done with the book, I called Mark. I said, get this guy in the oh, studio. Oh, that's so great. Thank no, you. No, I... So and you know the thing that I, I I really didn't see that I didn't understand how interested people were in in these yeah. what I call like remembrances or yeah, whatever no. um, uh, until you know I started putting them on Facebook a little bit right. you know unedited right. uh, not very good at first because you know my structure was not great and uh, but I wanted to make them as readable as possible not just to musicians the musicians are always going to relate. Right. And enjoy the stories, but I wanted it to be uh, to be readable to normal normal people, you know. I'd like to, I mean, because you know, there's a show busy part of radio, and but the part about getting sober. Yeah. I mean, that's where I was drawn to, and I said, wait a minute, let's get this guy in the show. Yeah. What was the moment? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think when people ask you, what was the moment? What was the interview? What was the time? What was the place? Where do you look? Taking alcohol and drugs out of it. Uh -huh. what, what was the moment for you? And you said, wow, I'm really here. Uh, you mean as far as my sobriety yeah, goes? Yeah, no, about playing, about playing drums. Um, oh well, I would I would say there was a couple of a couple of uh, a couple of gigs that I started mm -hmm. doing that really made me that 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 I recognized that I've made it. Yeah. You know, Jackson Brown. So I worked with Jackson in the uh, in the late '80s. As I did I did two records with Jackson. The one I'm com I'm on completely called World in Motion. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a terrific record. Uh, and that would be 87 through 92-ish. But I kind of blew that, I blew that gig out of the water, unfortunately. Um, I, and it was like the height of my, of my using career, unfortunately. And uh, Jackson being the, the... There's a story he takes you out and yeah, talks. The amazingly compassionate and empathetic, yeah. empathetic person that he is. He never, he never confronted you. He, he never really confronted me about it. There was, there were, there were uh, like nightly, maybe after the show, confrontations where I go, "Hey, yeah. things weren't quite what they should be tonight. Would, is there anything I can do to help? Yeah. We, can we, you know?" I'd be like, "No, what do you mean?" It's like yeah. you know, I was sort of, in, I was uh, not sort of, I was in denial about oh, sure. it, you know. Yeah. Uh, until he took me out to it was he took me out to a little diner and we had a piece of pie, pie together. Yeah. You know he literally called he called me up you know from room to room and said hey, you know you want to take a drive and I I, I love that story and, by the way. Yeah, thank you and having no idea what he was talking about, yeah. I said sure let's take a drive. And we went, and we ended up at this diner and we weren't talking hardly at all about anything. Uh, and sure enough, we ordered a piece of pie and uh, and I just knew at that point that um, that I was going to be let go. And I was. But if you think about the yeah. power of the disease, mm -hmm. instead of staying with Jackson Brown, I'll go on. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I've seen that moment many times. Yeah. I, and, and I hadn't really seen that moment so profound since. You know, I, I, I have to say that, you know, I mean, that, that gig in particular, I, I was, what, 27, 28 years yeah. old, something yeah. like that, um, 26. Uh, it was one of the highlights of my career regardless and it was also one of my most profound teaching moments of course yeah. because ever since then I, I had a deeper understanding about what you know what drugs and alcohol could could do to my career to my life to my body to yeah. my mental everything you know um, but it took me a long time to get to that point where I was done animal one of my favorite people <laughs> <laughs> I, I told my grandson I was gonna move animal um, <laughs> You were in the in the new Muppets. Your your animal. So it was called the Muppets Tonight, yeah. and my one of my benefactors uh, in in my career, a, a, an amazing composer named Richard Gibbs, who was actually the original keyboard player with a band called Oingo Boingo. You know, it's sort of an alt rock. You know, very popular, especially in Los Angeles in Southern California. You know, um, was my benefactor uh, for that gig uh, amongst. Oh. A lot of other, I mean, I've done 20, 25 different films with Richard as the drummer and as a percussionist. But this Muppets Tonight show came up for him, and he's like, and he was like, well, what am I going to do to kind of reinvent, but but stay true to what the Muppets was always about, you know? <laughs> he said, well, you know, we'll have a band, we'll have a live band. It was actually Freebo, the guy I mentioned, the bass player, uh, and an accordion player, sort of coming full cycle from my experience at Shakey's when I was 12 years old. And we d it was a Zydeco vibe. It was a Zydeco theme, and uh, and I had the opportunity to play Animal 
<laughs> as I guess I was Animal's muse or he was my muse. I'm not sure which way you would look more at than, it. More than you know. More than I know. More than you know. And, and also probably one of the most popular things that I've done when I talk to people yeah. about my career. Yeah. Um, and if you see the, the, uh, the drum battle with Dave Grohl yeah. in particular, uh, that, w that was right in that period of time that I was, that I was animal and I was fortunate to be, to be involved in that amongst all sorts of other, yeah. So, and when I talk to young, well, it's interesting when I talk to younger people, and there's a story in there about me after one of my many surgeries, just recently actually, a, few year, a couple years ago, and I was talking to a nurse about my career. She was kind of interested, and I mentioned a couple of things that I had done. But when I mentioned, yes, I was animal on the Muppets Tonight, she she was <laughs> just was <laughs> fascinated. You were you what were. animal, really? Yeah. You know. So I get that, like, oh, you the guy that you're, Billy. He's that guy on the radio. <laughs> I'm gonna right. Let it go. You must come yes. in and do a radio show. Um, I do a Saturday morning th Please, uh, radio yeah, I'd show. Please, yeah, love to. And I'll maybe bring Susan in. We'll talk about traveling. That would be awesome. But I think yeah. you guys, we'll get that book before you get out of here. Okay. Again, um, uh, serendipitous, I don't know what you want to call it, but I pull up on a motorcycle and somebody hands me a book <laughs> and this guy's now sitting there doing the shoot. Yeah. It's a worthwhile read. Thank you and so much. No, no, Peter. no. I know somebody I'm giving it to when... when uh, I got when, more. I, well... Should, should I give info as to how to Absolutely. get a hold of it if you're interested? Shoot, shoot yeah, and I, ha I wanted to make sure Please. to write it down so I knew. Okay. So, I, I have, I have my New York, right? I have my PayPal account okay. and my, I have my Venmo account. It. So it's PayPal.me/sddogg32. That's PayPal. And it's, the book is twenty dollars, autographed by me. And thank you so much for promoting. I really appreciate that. And then uh, my Venmo is at Michael <laughs> slash Jokum, if you're interested. Or just message or, me or, on Facebook, and we'll figure out a way to get in, you. Or if you're in New York, the number is. <laughs> right, another exactly. Number. That's exactly what it looked like. This was so enjoyable to me. Thank and you the, so much. And uh, do yourself a favor. Thanks to Mark Crowley. Thanks to Brian Taylor. Thanks to Kelly Michaels. I'll see you every Saturday morning now at 9 o'clock. And give it a couple of weeks. And he'll be in a studio with us. Thanks, wow. you guys. Take care. Thank you. And thank you, Peter.